you want to like it. You feel like you should like it. Maybe there's some jazz that you like a lot, but you're intimidated to fully jump in. Maybe you hate the way that jazz sounds. Maybe it sounds like a stream of notes. It's dissonant. It sounds like three different people playing three different songs at the same time. I think this video would be useful even if you're jazz curious. Maybe you have a jazz playlist that you really love, but you can't really remember the names of any of the artists or albums. None of them are really making a big enough impact to really join your daily listening. Maybe you're guilty of what I used to do, which is getting two songs into an album and then losing focus and dipping. Now, if you're in this camp, you would probably say that you like jazz, but I bet you're also a little worried that you might come across as like a fraud. That's how I used to feel. Always worried that some real jazz head is gonna see right through you like a greasy paper bag. I'm here to show you that there's a reason why you can't get into jazz and it's not your fault. So sit back, relax, grab a coffee, grab a tea, get some of those peanuts with the shell still on. This is your guide to finally getting into jazz. So in the lead up to this video, I've been researching a lot of jazz hate. There are entire threads on Reddit dedicated to people who are so surprised that anyone could even remotely like jazz. I've actually created a spreadsheet of these complaints and started to organize them into categories. Through this process, I've come to the conclusion that there are four main obstacles that are keeping you and others from enjoying jazz to its fullest. First off, you may be scared or intimidated of the genre or some aspects of it. Secondly, there's a disconnect in time. You don't have the same reference points that your grandparents or great-grandparents had when they were approaching this genre. And I think that really affects how we view this style of music. And the third obstacle is that you may not fully understand how jazz works, which is a little vague, but every genre has characteristics. And the more you know about what these characteristics are and how they work, the more you'll know what you're listening for. And the fourth and final obstacle is that your ear just maybe hasn't had enough time to get used to the harmonic palette that jazz has. And the fix for this one is simple. You just need to listen to more jazz music. But the difficult thing is, how do you know where to start? Don't worry, we're gonna overcome these obstacles one by one. And once we've moved through these steps, you're gonna have everything you need to confidently call yourself a jazz fan. Or at least you'll have the courage to start really listening. There's a strange feeling with jazz that in order to like it, in order to really get into it, you have to know every artist, every subgenre, every style, every recording, but it's just not true. I mean, the perennial fear is that you're at a party and you run into some legit jazz head. What if you say the wrong thing, you don't know this album or that album, and you're gonna look like a fool or something like that. This is part of where the intimidating quality of jazz comes from. Really, jazz can feel intimidating for quite a few reasons. Jazz can seem academic, it's got a large musical vocabulary, and sometimes the sheer amount of subgenre can be paralyzing. And much like punk, metal, or hip hop, there are also quite a few jazz fans that act as genre gatekeepers. These people don't always have bad intentions, they just love something so much that they're kind of jerks about it. They might think the only real jazz is bebop, or swing, or modal jazz, or you're only really a jazz fan if you're also a musician, or if you like this album or that artist or any other qualifier. Forget these people, you're allowed to be a dabbler. You can like some stuff and not like others. It is not mandatory that you know who the baritone sax player was on a specific album, or who composed the original version of this song in 1928. You're allowed to just listen. Now that we've dealt with that, I think another intimidating thing about jazz is its size. It's an incredibly broad genre that subdivides and subdivides further into an incredible amount of musical styles. So in order to break down some of those barriers, I'm gonna very quickly define some of the most popular subgenres of jazz. A lot of these you've almost certainly heard of out there in the pop culture stew. Okay, let's get that cocktail party ammunition in your brain. First, we have bebop. This is a style of jazz that first emerged in the 1940s with a focus on breakneck tempos, intricate solos, and experimental harmonies. It was pioneered by musicians who were tired of the big band swing scene. Its heroes include people like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Next, we have Cool Jazz. Cool Jazz was arguably created by Miles Davis with his album, The Birth of Cool. It was responding to the intensity of bebop, slowing down the tempo and making the statement that virtuosity doesn't just lie in technique. 
Cool Jazz has also been credited with bringing jazz back into the mainstream after the perceived academia of bebop. The next subgenre is one you've probably heard of, and that's big band jazz. Big bands have been around since the 1910s, but most people associate the term big band with the swing era during the 30s and 40s. These bands were, well, big, with large horn and rhythm sections. Songs were composed for their catchiness and danceability. Next, we have a subgenre that's a little bit more vague, jazz fusion. Basically, it's just jazz mixed with influences from other genres such as rock and roll, R&B, electronic music, or funk. The golden age of jazz fusion was in the 1970s, but it's still going strong today. Next, we have the much maligned, but much misunderstood, avant-garde jazz. This is probably the jazz you don't like. It's experimental to its core, questioning and breaking down all previous assumptions of the genre. It's characterized more by what it's rejecting than what it encompasses. It can be atonal, rhythmically unstable, and filled with highly challenging improvisation. I like this stuff, don't get me wrong, but I wouldn't start here. That being said, jazz isn't just for some artsy educated elite. It didn't start that way, and it's not that way today. So don't worry about it. You're cool enough and smart enough to get into jazz just the way you are. So even if you've gotten rid of your imposter syndrome a bit, the next barrier to enjoying jazz is probably its complexity and dissonance. But I don't think we should tackle that yet until we know why it's evolved to sound like that. The question that I really want to answer for you guys here is, why was it so much easier for our grandparents and great-grandparents to get into jazz, like the cool swinging cats that they were, or are? Well, the truth is we've lost some context with the story of jazz, what it means. See, there was no Spotify in the 20s, 30s, and 40s when jazz was growing up. There wasn't even jukeboxes. There were records, of course, but people still wanted to hear those big catchy songs that they knew well, that their friends knew, and that they liked to dance to. And that's another thing, jazz was originally dance music. For this, you needed a band, and that band needed to know the songs that you already wanted to hear. This led to a lot of bands playing popular tunes that everybody would recognize. You may have heard these songs referred to as the American Songbook or more importantly for our story, jazz standards. Jazz is built on these as a foundation, and later songs written purely within the jazz tradition became standards in their own right, being copied, expanded upon, and challenged. Now you don't have to be super familiar with the entire American songbook or have heard every jazz standard ever in order to really enjoy the genre. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm saying is that the more jazz you listen to, the more versions of these songs you'll inevitably be exposed to and you'll see how different artists choose to interpret them. This is not to say that every jazz song is based off a standard, that's not true. But the more listening you do, the more you'll be able to see this tradition of borrowing, interpolating, and challenging different aspects of the music. You might be thinking that that's all well and good, it makes jazz more interesting, but it still just sounds like a bunch of notes to me. I don't know what I'm listening to. Firstly, we have to talk about harmony. Jazz has more harmonic ingredients than you might be used to. Let me explain. You have notes, play them together, and you have a chord. Group these chords together in little pleasing groups, and you have yourself a key. In pop, these are usually major or minor, happy or sad. With a lot of jazz, chords are given extra notes, changing their sound a bit. This gives you more options per chord. In addition, jazz loves to borrow chords from other scales, as long as they fit the sound. This gives you a lot of options. It means that the musical vocabulary is a lot larger than other genres that you might already love. Calm down, metalheads, I see you. This large harmonic palette can be a little bit shocking and strange even, if you're used to, say, pop music or rock and roll. So allow yourself to become acquainted with these new sounds. They're not so scary once you become familiar with them and how they can make a song feel. Another big characteristic of jazz is improvisation, improv. The earliest forms of jazz were definitely less about improv, but the jazz mainstream has been improv heavy for a long time now. It's kind of like the curb your enthusiasm or whose line is it anyway of music. Musicians are spontaneously creating new melodies on the spot, and this is kind of unusual. There's improv in the blues and rock and roll and hip hop, even in some classical music, but it's just not delivered in the raw quantity that jazz provides. After the head section of a given song, which is often the main theme, the catchier part that might get stuck in your head, 
Artists tend to trade solos and make new interpretations of the song's main motifs. They can pull them apart, depart from them if they need, or bring in new qualities that challenge the feeling of the original melody. Often musicians will break out in pure stream of consciousness soloing, and this is pure improvisation. And this really adds a lot of excitement to the music once you realize this. The musicians all have to have incredible nonverbal communication to pull this off. It really makes the music feel alive, like it's happening right now, and you as the listener are part of it. The third bit that allows jazz to work the way it does is a vibe. Now this is probably gonna annoy some jazz listening nerds, but I don't think it's gonna tick off too many jazz musicians, because you hear this stuff from jazz legends all the time, talking about their own music or the music of others. Uh, does the music roll? Does it swing? Is it in the pocket? Does it have a groove? Is it crunchy? Uh, Wynton Marsalis, the famous trumpet player, he always talks about music having a light to it, or musicians playing with a certain light. Now, some of these describe an element of music like rhythm or melody, some of them are general, but they're all pretty vague, which to me makes a lot of sense because jazz does have a very intense musical aesthetic, but it's super blurry around the edges, which is why I'm totally comfortable boiling it down to the really not musicologist approved vibe. If someone else has a better description for it, I'd love to hear it in the comments, go nuts. By the way, this is not coffee, it's I don't know if you can see it. It's red, red Powerade. Okay, here's where we talk about the most disliked thing in all of jazz. In my research, nothing came up as frequent as musical dissonance. People who don't like jazz often don't like it for this reason alone. And musical dissonance is just, well, notes that sound bad together. Jazz often likes to play with these dissonant sounds, either to build tension or add texture, advance a certain feeling. Especially in solos, there's less of a sense of straightforward harmony. If you're not used to this, it can be a little unsettling, but as you listen to more jazz, you'll start to get desensitized to the shock factor of dissonant sounds. I've heard people compare the dissonance in jazz to spicy food or hot sauce. At first, it's a bit overwhelming, but over time you build a tolerance and then you even start to enjoy the heat a little bit. Starting off with some very challenging and dissonant jazz would be like eating Carolina Reapers when you're just used to bell peppers. So this brings us to a really common misconception about jazz, that you can just play any note that you want, regardless of the chords or the scales. And this actually may be true of some of the you know craziest free jazz or avant-garde, which I also dig, by the way. But for really the lion's share of jazz that involves soloing, these musicians are making conscious decisions about how much dissonance they want to add. They're following chord changes and they're making choices to add a little bit of crunchiness. Even for me, there's a tipping point where too much dissonance starts to hinder my enjoyment of the music. But the right amount adds depth and texture and it makes the musical resolutions more satisfying. So be open to it, kind of let the dissonance challenge you, let it wash over. In a few weeks you're going to be wanting more and more. Now I think for people who didn't grow up with it, jazz is often an acquired taste. Now I'm sure there's some jazz that you could listen to and like it right off the bat. But for a lot of jazz music, it's something where the more you listen, the more your ability to appreciate the music grows. So I put together a quick course of listening to loosen up your jazzy inclinations and get your ear tuned into the sounds of the genre. So here they are, 12 albums. Mostly classics, but some newer gems as well. First off, we have Bill Evans' trio, At the Village Vanguard. Smooth, cool, and driven by the lyrical piano genius of Bill Evans. A great easy start to your listening course. Secondly, we have Oscar Peterson's Night Train. Now, if I didn't mention the great Oscar Peterson, I'd probably get my Canadian citizenship revoked. Check out the track, I Got It Bad, and That Ain't Good. The third album in our chorus is Duke Ellington and John Coltrane. Here we have the most famous big band leader in jazz history, teaming up with the more modern and experimental sax legend John Coltrane. An absolutely legendary record. Now you might feel a little bit more challenged by some of the dissonant sounds you hear on this record, but I think by this point in the course, you're probably starting to dig it a little bit. For number four, we have Miles Davis with Kind of Blue. This is the best-selling jazz record of all time, and it's one of my all-time favorites. 
Here you'll find fewer chord changes, but much more melodic exploration. This is also one of the foundational albums that kicked off the modal jazz subgenre. Next up, we have another incredible album with Time Out by the Dave Brubeck Quartet. This is the album that has that classic song, Take Five. You'll probably recognize this one, even if you've never dabbled in jazz. For number six, we're back to something that's a little less challenging with Chet Baker Sings by the trumpet player and vocalist Chet Baker. I had to throw in at least one vocal jazz album, so here's a really good one. Chet's smoky, quiet voice works perfectly with standards like I Fall In Love Too Easily and My Funny Valentine. For number seven, we have Solo Monk by Thelonious Monk. Thelonious Monk is an absolute virtuoso, and here he is playing without any accompaniment. If you've gained any appreciation for jazz at all by this point, you'll love this album. Number eight is John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. I'm done arguing whether this album is modal jazz or post-bop or free jazz influenced. I think Coltrane really kind of evades definitions with this one, so just feel it out. This one might be a little challenging to newcomers, but it's really, really good if you can get into it. Next, for number nine, we have a really interesting one, Headhunters by Herbie Hancock. This is our first jazz fusion recommendation, and it's a great welcome to the 1970s. Herbie Hancock blends funk, rock, and a whole bunch more into this trippy and amazingly inventive record. Moving into the 90s with number 10, we have Slide 5's People, Places, and Things. This is acid jazz fused with 90s electronic and ambient. It's somehow both funky and chill at the same time. It makes for great driving music. But admittedly, if there's any album on this list which is shoehorned in because of my own personal preference, it has to be this underrated gem of an album. Moving into more contemporary jazz, we have an album that I absolutely love. We Like It Here by Snarky Puppy. 2014 was a great year for me, and it was also a great year for jazz. Check out the song Lingus and get ready to have your mind blown. I would highly recommend finding a version of them playing Lingus live on YouTube just to get a sense of how incredibly talented this group of musicians is. And lastly, for number 12, we have Parahelion by Sungazer. Now here's a group that's pushing the boundaries of jazz in so many ways. Check out the opening song, Threshold. Now, I don't want to spoil too much. Just listen to this one. You're still here. That's great. Uh, I think you've earned some extra homework. If you're interested in learning more about the history of jazz, I would highly recommend Ken Burns' docuseries. It's called Jazz, and it's narrated by Darth Vader, so definitely worth watching. And if you really want to take that next step in your jazz relationship, I would highly recommend learning a little bit of music theory. There's lots of cram courses, some are just like an hour long on YouTube, and even just that will really help inform your appreciation of the music. Maybe even pick up an instrument. It's a lot more fun that way instead of just learning rote music theory. I can't believe I recommended that. Start with the instrument and learn the music theory with it. Plus it's fun and it's, it's, uh, it's good for your brain. I'm starting to ramble, so that means that this video is pretty much done. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching. And please let me know in the comments if there's a musical acquired taste that you'd like me to cover in a future video. Cheers, and uh, see you next time.